sales company. We started probably about seven years ago now. <clears throat> we were agri-energy dealers just to the farm. Um, we used their products. We started working with the Hats and Bickler equipment out of Austria and thought legally we should be separated from our farms. So we started another company. Um, it's grown a lot faster than we thought it would. Um, got one full-time sales staff member. Um, we probably should have about three. My brother and I both work at the sales company as well. Um, it's kind of our winter project so that we don't get to see our home when we're supposed to be at home, I guess. But we really do enjoy meeting people and talking with people and learning from other people. Seeing how things work different across the whole nation. So. Uh, our farm is Bayshore Farms. We didn't branch out a lot of names. We kind of kept it the same, but uh, my dad, Ben, and I farmed together. Um, we're, my brother and I are fifth generation on that family farm. Um, it's actually my mom's family farm, which is somewhat unique to a lot of people. She was one of four girls. Uh, we're right in the, the base of the thumb, where the thumb meets the hand, right by the Saginaw Bay. Um, so we have somewhat of a little bit of a microclimate. We tend to warm up a little bit quicker and freeze later than even the people that are 20 or 30 miles south of us. So we started transition. We actually bought uh, in 01. We had a bunch of conventional ground. We were doing 3,700 acres conventional. We we're in three different counties. To Michigan at that time was fairly large. Um, we had. I believe we had about 1,700 acres of dry apple beans that year, and we harvested 300. The rest of them got harvested with a disc. So Dad came to my brother and I, I was still in high school, my brother was down in Michigan State, and said, we're doing something different, or we're not going to continue to farm. You know, we got to change our practices, change our ways. So we found a farm that was already certified organic. It was 40 miles from home. Um, purchased that farm and had a processing plant and markets with it. So we wanted to have somewhat of an end because we've always been uh, added value kind of farmers as far as we were uh, started a smaller co-op for dry edible beans conventionally. We were in an alfalfa co-op, we were in soybean co-op that was all farmer based. Um, so we really wanted to be in control of where our crops were going. As of today, we're 2,400 acres of organic cash crops. Right now, we're doing corn, dry beans. Um, the dry beans that we've been doing for the last few years are white kidney beans, great northern beans, and black beans. But over the years, we've grown just about every flavor of dry bean out there besides the garbanzo bean, because they don't grow in Michigan. Um, we do some string beans. Uh, that's kind of unique. In our area, there's not very many people that grow them. We plant them. We get told when to plant them. We plant them. We take care of them. We foliar feed them. It's all custom harvest, custom truck, and we get a check. It's nice because it's only a 60-day crop. So you guys are looking at dry beans. Or maybe you think about dry beans as a real short-day crop. Well, we wanted something shorter yet so that we could do some more cover cropping and, and break our weed cycle again in a different way. We still do some soybeans. We got into organic soybeans as our big, big player. We kind of backed down a little bit on them. And as of right now, we've gone. This will be our third year without growing any wheat. Um, markets in Michigan for wheat are pretty tough because it's all food grade wheat. And a lot of people that want organic are not looking for anything with gluten. So that's a tough one to flush. So. I think it was said already, kind of, weed control in our mind definitely starts in the fall. You have to get your, some form of nitrogen, if you don't have enough left over from your crop, you make sure you get some nitrogen applied onto whatever kind of residue you have out there. Get it spread on, get it sprayed on, whether it's some kind of manure or fish product or whatever you prefer to use. We use dry chicken manure on our farm because that's what's available to us. It's a product we like to use. And then, either right before we spread the manure or right after we spread the manure, we go across the field with our, our haggy and we spray residue on it. 
Everything that has any sizable matter that we have to break down, especially anything in corn stalks, those lignans need to have that extra work <coughs> and that residue. Um, when we first started with it, we didn't we're like, well, how can this really work that much better? We left the strip. If you have a time meter and you want to know how much better it works, don't spray 90 feet or 60 feet or whatever your boom is. When you go back and spring the time meter, you'll find it. Period. It works. The only time I've seen it have, have a struggle is real dry winters. But everything works a lot slower when it's dry. So. We try and fall till everything, especially our stock, corn, corn stalks. Um, if we can, we fall till and put a cover on it. And then we terminate the cover in the spring. But we're constantly trying to size those stalks into a manageable length. We want to use our time meter like it, think it does a good job, but we have to have that residue managed somehow to get through there. So we actually just put on um, Comer chopping rollers on our corn head. Um, to, to, they call them confetti knives. They blow your stalks. I don't know how many of you have seen them or whatever, but it's a big investment, but it works very well. And even, even the stubble that's on the ground, you push on it with your foot and just flattens right out because it's all mushroomed and busted apart. Right? So now you're making a lot more injury points for that residue to work. Um, again, nitrogen is essential to break down. Um, reduce uh, residues, speeds up the composting action in the soil. Um, we don't use a lot of compost on our farm right now. We used a lot when we started. We're going to go back to using some again. We're, we're finding out things that we lost when we lost the compost. To a certain extent, um, we've seen our soil um, compost a lot for itself. We can eat up a lot of material in a quick amount of time using just manures, but you shouldn't be doing it that way every year. You still have to have some compost in there and build back up that biological. Um, and then the root accidents that you get off of those cover crops throughout the winter, in the spring, and fall, whatever it is, it's outstanding. We had a, a field right along the highway, and it's blow sand. It's a black blow sand, but it's, I mean, it's powder. And it usually, for the first 60 acres, usually doesn't produce much over, right at, right at the highway is probably about 110 bushel corn at best. And as you go across that first quarter mile, you might pick up to 160 bushel, and then the field gets quite a bit heavier and a lot better. Um, two years ago, we put a mixture of peas and radishes out there, Austrian winter peas and radishes. For two years now, that first 60 acres has out yielded the next 60 acres, which is way better. So what those cover crops can do for you is far more than what you know until you actually see it. Um, initial spring tillages, it's, to us it's very important to get out there, it has to be right, it can't be too wet. We will get, like Dean said, we have a loamy soil, but it can get tight real quick. And if you abuse it, you're done for the year. But we have to make sure that we're level, and then we need the rains to make sure that we get a good, consistent seed bed prep so that we have you know, when you want to put your corn in there at two inches or whatever you're planting, that whole level is, we're good moisture at that point. We're going to further size the residue again, um, and uh, warm up the soil. This is 60 foot high speed disc, which at 60 feet is not real high speed because it takes almost, if you want to pull that 11 mile an hour, you need two of those 600 horse tractors. <laughs> but at seven mile an hour, it does a real nice job. That one's designed to not go quite as fast as some of the other ones. Um, so it still gets good mixing action. I was trying to find a picture of us terminating rye with this because we had some where I think the rye was about 18 inches tall. And in one pass, we had it chopped up, mowed down, blown around. We didn't mow it off first. It was, I'd say, 95% kill in the first pass, which that's pretty impressive for it. And it was, it was thick. We've tried killing rye for years, and we've always had rye as a cover. It can be a real struggle at times. 
Um, we're going to keep on tilling. One of our big things is even with our corn, we're going to try and get out there, warm it up, get our flushes going, and keep killing those flushes off because every chance that you get to turn that dirt and kill that next flush off before you plant is better off. Um, change directions in your passes. So the first time we might go corner to corner on a field on a 45. And then we'll go, sometimes we'll go sideways, right? 90 is what we're planting. And, you know, but every time we're on a different angle, we make the guys mark the, the, the lines that they use. So when they come in there, they can go to the last line and make sure they're on a different one. Um, and then, like I said, about, for us, it's about seven to ten days that we're hitting those fields as, as the flushes come up. A lot easier to kill them in the small. And we're seeing if you get, in Michigan, we can get some rains and it'll just rain, 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 and all of a sudden that <coughs> Nice mat of weeds that you had like this is like this, and now you're drawing a lot of nutrients and everything else, and it's going to take more nitrogen to break that all down. And now you got bugs too, probably. So, something that I think is quite important on our farm is planter preparation. A lot of people don't think about the planter when they think about weed control. But you got to really look at that your planter is zeroed out before you go to the field. If you're going to use a time meter, a rotary hoe, any kind of a tool that's going to dig in the ground when you can't see your seed, you want to know that all your seed is at the same depth. You don't want to think, well, I just dug up that row and it's good, but row number 12 might be an inch higher, or a half inch higher, or a quarter inch higher. If we go out there with our time meters or our rotary hose, we're trying to stay, you know, if our, if our seed's in there like this, this is the top of our seed. We're staying a quarter inch above that seed with that top. So you want it all the same depth. You got to make sure that your linkages are nice and tight so that you're pulling straight. When you come back to elevate, you don't want rows that were going like this because your parallel linkages are all over. Check your openers. Make sure that you're not going to let any dry dirt go in there. And have your meters checked. Emergence is key, and especially key to weed control. If everything comes up the same, it's a lot easier to do your job. So utilizing some of the planter technologies, there's there's some really nice and really expensive things out there. But uh, one of the things that I really thought is pretty intuitive for the newest stuff is that smart I don't know how many of you have seen that from precision planting? Um, I don't work for precision planting, I don't sell it, but I do think it's a nice thing. It actually reads your seeds of your soil, it reads the um, organic material of your soil and the moisture of your soil. So if you go out to the field and you're planting, and you dig up seed and you think it's in good moisture and your dad comes out and digs up the seed, does he have the same opinion every time? No. And that's what it is, it's an opinion. Because you don't know what moisture is. There's been studies showing and there's all kinds of data that backs it up how much moisture you need to have good germination for corn, for wheat, for all these other crops. Tools like this can really help us make sure that we do a good job and have good fields. 2020 monitor, it's a lot of the stuff is precision planning type stuff, but they're one of the, Don does a lot of it too, I think. Um, so. There's other companies out there doing this, and this is what you're going to be looking to see coming in weed control as well. Your, your cultivators are going to become smart cultivators. Your time leaders are going to become smart time leaders. We already have some pretty smart things on them, but it's going to be better. Um, we're going to talk about that. Consistent planting depth, consistent spacing of crops. Wherever you don't have a corn plant that was supposed to be a corn plant, there's a huge potential for weeds. Even emergence. Um, the one precision guy by us did a big study on corn. And he's done quite a bit with sugar beets too. But they go out and they GPS flag every corn plant and they, they've got like 15 different farmers. So it's all different kinds of equipment, all different kinds of soil. And they they have a, a pogo stick that a high pants is on top and it puts a GPS mark every spot that they hit it on the ground. And they check the difference in the yield from the emergence dates in corn and in sugar beets. And it's quite staggering what it is from uh, 
I think it's about three days. You have about three days from the first plan of emergence to have all your corn. You start having a bigger window than that, then your, your smaller corn is just a weed. So pre-emerge, um, just these are the three that we typically use. Um, left one first, and it kind of goes down in, in the order that we use them. Uh, Tine leader works great in light soil, loose soil. It works all right in heavy soil as long as it's loose, and it will work good in a light crust. If they're getting into a heavy crust, it's going to have a hard time. You can get, you can get the, the good tine leaders to penetrate, but your second, third, fourth, and fifth row of tines are going to want to cheat into whatever your first ones did. Um, works best, the tine leader works best in fine soil without lumps. Uh, works best with uh, residues that's well managed. If you have a lot of residue and you don't manage it, it will be a big break and you will have piles at the end of every row. Um, we've had that. We've taken those piles and put them on our buffer strips. We've burned them in place before. Um, different things that we've done. But preferably, as long as we have the weather to get the, the residues and everything to work, then we're good to go. Rotary hole, we've kind of stopped using our rotary hole. Um, but there are a few times that it, it is still uh, key. If you do get a heavy crust, it's good to go. In, in non-crusted soils, though, it really doesn't work really well a lot for you. It pokes a lot of holes in the ground and it creates a lot of compaction. Um, in the flame leader, uh, we typically use ours pre-emerge if we're going to use it. It's there for a rescue tool post-emerge, ready to go. So he's full of gas, um, but it's typically used for pre-emerge if we need it. Let's see if we need to do that. Here we go. So this is a pre-emerge, I believe this is corn. Not that it matters, it's all on the ground. Um, oh, I'm off, you hear this on the tractor. Um, we can move along at a pretty good speed. It takes a little bit of time to get it set up. Like I said, you want to stay at a quarter inch above your sprouts. That's a pretty, you can, you can stay a half inch if you're not comfortable with a quarter inch. I mean, I wouldn't try and get any closer than that quarter inch because you're going to have a few that are a little bit quicker coming than what you're doing. If you break off that sprout, it's game over. So we can run, typically I probably go in about Eight and a half to nine mile an hour with that one. That one's 88 feet wide. The smaller ones we can run over 10 with, as long as you're going smooth. Um, in corn, this is typically what we're looking for. So this is the point when we want to time it the first time. Um, it's usually 48 hours after planting. Sometimes low from water, depends on the weather. Make sure you're digging up a lot of seeds in a lot of different places along that time here. Because if you did have that high row, or you fall in one deep row and you think you're okay and you hit all them sprouts, you're going to be sick for a long time. I it. It's not fun. <laughs> we all just want to plant every field once, right? Each year, just one time. Unless you're going for a second crowd. Here's our rotary hole, looks a lot like Jerry's. Um, pretty much the same thing. Front unit is solid, back unit, ours are five gain units. And we stagger them exactly between the wheels and the front. So you know, they have both this much gap between every rotary hole wheel, and there's another one in the second gang that's right between them. Um, like I said, this tool does work good, really good in a cross. It will work all right in looser soils too, we found better ways now that don't create so much compaction. We were having a lot of problems with foxtail and compaction and things like that. And since we've stopped using this so much, we don't have near the compaction issues that we used. Here's our flame burner. It's a 24 row. Um, those are red dragon units. It's all in gallon LP tank. So 
So these are some black beans. Um, this picture is the one on the right was taken quite a few years ago. The one on the left was probably two years ago. Um, one thing about the weeders that we use and we sell, um, we had a hydraulic time adjust. Pre-merge, you're gonna pretty much set your depth and you're gonna go. Post-merge, in a half mile field, we might move that time adjust seven times across the half mile field. And you sit there and set your GPS in your tractor and hopefully you got something to help you steer because you need to be looking back the whole time. And you just play with a little bit more aggressive, a little bit less aggressive and just watch the beans or the corn or whatever come off the back. Corn is the hardest thing to time. I have not found anything harder yet. Same guy that does the spare, so I bet that's probably good. This is a uh, picture cup of doing corn the first time through. Corn is quite a bit easier if it's real fine soil, sandy soil. It's pretty easy to time weed. Get into your heavier soils, it's a little bit harder. This is something that we started doing last year. So it's quite a, quite a big difference between what's not done and what's done there. Um, this we're actually running a hats bickler camera guidance hitch on it with the tying leader and we're going about five to six mile an hour with two to three times out over each row. So it's working kind of like a cultivator would, but it doesn't throw any big lumps and it doesn't move as much dirt so you won't bury your crop. This I just showed so you can see the gaps. It's not much of a gap that we took out. There's a gap between there. This is actually following her own. I'm not the best camera guy either, sorry. To get that to work, it, it makes cultivation a, a real breeze the first time through. Um, video of the time we are running on the camera guidance. So that big blue thing at the bottom of the screen there, that's actually your side shift hitch. Um, it has, uh, from Hatsbeck, where they have American quick hitch on the front and on the back, so it can go from implement to implement to implement. Most, most of them clamp on to a cultivator, and then you would have to have the same style frame to clamp on to, which is a European frame. Um, we went to the company, the engineers, and asked them to build it so that we could use it for burners, we could use it for cultivators, we could use it for titlers. Somebody's going to spend $30,000 on a camera guidance hitch that should be able to be used across the whole spectrum of what they want to do, not just that one cultivator. So this is actually on our home farm. Pretty flat, which I'm, the picture's a little pixelated, sorry. But, uh, now we're moving into cultivators. Um, so we run two different kinds of cultivators currently. We've got one from Hats and Bickler, which is called the Vibro Shank. Um, this video is what I guess it is. Um, it's a modified S time, so it's got the top loop of an S time, and the lower part of the leg is a straight shank, so it doesn't give the side to side motion that an S time will. It doesn't want to dance around the bigger weeds. Um, this we're running cutaway discs on the front, and they're set to about a three inch band of six mile an hour. Camera takes all the stress out of it. It's used to a lot of it. Really tested your religion. There is the two things that the cameras can fall short on. You have to have a color variance between the ground and the crop you know so you can find it. Um, and then you have to have you have to have a clear line of sight. So if you got a lot of dust blowing right in front of your camera, it 
might have to stop for a second let the dust clear and go again. But uh, the ones that are coming in the future will be multi cameras um, with row crop um, crop recognition. So what they're telling me they're, they've been running them in Europe for a few years. They'll actually be able to pick out a corn plant basically in somebody's front lawn because you use 3D imagery to look at what the actual shape you leave and decide that that's a corn plant. Would be the same. This is the cutaway disc that we have on there, cut with a fairly narrow band. And then I had the shovels actually set just about the same width as the cutaway disc because there's a wing on that shovel on each side to undercut. This was uh, this is this is probably our most challenging field on our farm. This is very sandy soil. And <coughs> you get one on and you go from not having weeds to having weeds like this. It's just it's fun. This is one of our customers, so it's on a different cultivator. But I thought it was a good video. He's doing a little bit larger black beans. He's got he's actually cutting leaves off his black beans on both sides, but never did cut out his plants. So, a little defoliation, but he was down quite a few weeks ago. This is not something that I've seen here, but um, I think up in the northern parts or the parts of Canada over this area, they do a lot of uh, narrow row stuff. In Europe, they actually cultivate their so that camera has the ability to even do that narrow of a row. We have the ability to build cultivators that narrow. Um, I don't have any videos of it, but they actually make a front mount with the camera so that you can cultivate your meat before you're on the road. And I think that would be the way I would want to do it because it kind of carries a little bit more driving first. But, um, so cultivate two to four times depending on meat pressure on our farm. Um, I didn't say the other, the other kind of cultivator we run is, a, I didn't have any pictures of it, it's an orphan single sweep. Um, <coughs> and we've got independent rolling shields on that on each side. If you're going to run a shield, it's, it's crucial to have independent shields. Because if you have a wheel track or something that's lower on one side and your other row is higher, the other side of your row, you don't want just a single axle picking your shields up and down. You've got to be able to control your dirt flow from both sides. Um, so we'll cultivate. And then typically, especially after first cultivation, a lot of times we'll go back in with our time meter one to two days after cultivation. It'll get any of them plants, especially if it was damper when you had cultivated the first time, anything that you transplanted back up to the row, it'll pull them back out. It'll cover up a few more weeds for you. Um, late season weeding and soybeans, we will go 90 degrees to the row. We've done some tests with time meeting soybeans, um, one field I think we did five times post um, And the yield was quite a bit better when we beat them beans up that much. We, the last time we threw it, they were about this tall. I mean, they were, they were big beans. We ripped a lot of leaves off, and they looked really bad for about a day. But they were, that field averaged out 70 bushel soybeans, and they were a clear high on the tofu. Typically about a 60 bushel. So this is the best that, that field's ever done. Um, finger weeders. We have some finger weeders. We sell finger weeders. I think that they're good in certain conditions. If you have loose sandy soil, they work really well. If you have anything that can get lumpy and clumpy on you, I don't like them because they'll stutter. If that thing stutters and you got it close to your row, it's going to knock out the plant, especially the corn. You can't sacrifice any um, Independent row protection, shields, cutaway discs, or owl knives. Um, we, we've been running, uh, we, we had sugar beets before we were organic, so we've always had cutaway discs of some sort. But uh, typically, without the camera hitch, we would only put them on if we needed them because it was a real challenge to do it. And to get across all those acres and add them all the time was pretty tough. But with the hitch, the camera hitch now, we're able to leave them on if you want to. It's not going to sacrifice any of your crop. Um, and 
like I said, the camera hits quite a bit more accurate than RTK. And all of our tractors are on RTK, and if you sit there and watch that hitch, it's moving an inch this way, two inches back that way, a half inch this way. It's constantly back there shifting. You think, you know, you watch your screen and it says 0, 0.0, you're right on GPS. But if your planner drifted at all or anything else, that's, you're off. And that camera will make up for it. So, just to go over a few things again. Start to fall, get your, get your residue broke down. Make sure your ground's fit. Time, you definitely want to start early with the time meter. If you know you have ground that's really productive in weeds, we'll do 24 hours and 48 hours. So we'll go out there the first time, go up and down the rows, and then the second time, typically, we'll turn and go 90 to them. Because, like Jerry said, first time through, if you can see the track planter marks, you're okay. You feel all right about it. But we had a hired guy that ran a leader. And he's probably about the only one, and it might be the only reason that he was the only one that did it, and that was his last time. He did 80 acres and drove down two rows, all at that whole 80 acres. So every 40 feet, there was two rows that were missing. Black beans there this week because it was spring fall. Um, after crop is up, make sure you get out there and time it as soon as you can on a rotary hole. It's a lot easier to get them weeds when they're small. Um, set up your first cultivation as tight as possible. Get in there, cut out as many as you can, and uh, time weed one to two days or a rotary hole. We've done it with before we had weeders, we used to rotary hole after we cultivated. But again, the compaction thing is why we stopped doing it. So that's basically it. Anybody have any questions? Did I miss anything somebody wanted to hear? Come see me after too. I'll stick around and chat. Thanks for having me.